In this video, I would like to discuss a master watchmaker by the name of Henri Louis Montandon, and he lived from 1789 to 1865. Henri Louis signed his watches and clocks H. L. Montandon a Copenhagen. Uh, he was the only Montandon maker to have uh, established himself in Denmark, and this is sort of a Danish link with the Montandon Watch Dynasty. Now, H.L. Montandon was born in La Bravine. His father was a justice, and uh, uh, his name was Jonas Louis. Uh, they were of the Blaisleon branch of Montandons, and this was a sub branch, Line de Balthazar. So the father was apparently assassinated on November 7th, 1796. And uh, it's not exactly clear under what circumstances. He was probably uh, waylaid on the road. This has happened. It's been documented in such a, uh, other ser situations. However, uh, by eight, the early 1800s, uh, we do find that Henri Louis has uh, located to uh, Copenhagen and uh, requested uh, permission to uh, engage in commerce there. And this is approximately 1817, 1818, when he was establishing himself in business. Uh, his earliest ch child was born uh, following this around 18... 17 to 1820 period. Uh, this was uh, Francis Louis or Francois Louis. He would later emigrate to the U.S. Uh, via Switzerland, uh, but he would also follow his father as a watchmaker in the trade. And uh, uh, this is rather interesting that he passed this uh, technology to his son, who went back to Switzerland for a period, but then eventually immigrated to the U.S., and uh, but continuing with Henri Louis, uh, he does appear to have married twice, uh, and the uh, first wife was Anne, Anne Schroeder of Elsinur, uh, and she and they married in Lochla. However, they moved to Denmark, and now it's interesting because uh, we find out that between eighteen twenty and eighteen twenty four. Uh, Henri Louis apparently uh, did some sort of work study or something along these lines in Paris. And he may have been at this period with the uh, so-called uh, Montana First Paris uh, establishment. Uh, he may have been actually working with them uh, at that time. It's not exactly clear where he was, but it's very... Uh, very um, likely that this was the case since they were all of the Blaisleon branch. They were all very, very closely tightly knit. And the Blaisleons in general appeared to be a very brave in venturing abroad and establish themselves in various different locations. Uh, but uh, Henri Louis did this very successfully in Copenhagen. And we find uh, his watches are somewhat rare uh, in their frequency. Uh, however, uh, he has a very large line of uh, mantle clocks, these so-called Ormalu uh, clocks, which we uh, find his name attached to, and I would like to discuss these in a little bit more detail. Um, now, he has what we have found many different uh, objects that appear in auctions, and these watch or clocks rather uh, go for a good price. Uh, they're of very good quality, and these are Empire period cl clocks from approximately the 1820s to the 1850s. Uh, so this was the period. They, some may have been as late as the 1860s, as he died in 1865. Uh, we don't know exactly when he stopped his watch career, but in clock career, but at any rate, um, we see a very interesting Charles X uh, 
this is so-called Apollo. Uh, it's a statue clock or mantel clock in the Ormolu style. Uh, and uh, it is signed HL, Montandon, Copenhagen. Uh, and we see Apollo atop this with a lyre at his side. And this is a very beautiful uh, object, which uh, is somewhat typical of what we know of his clocks. Uh, the clocks are, of course, key wind, um, key set, key wind, which is standard. Uh, moving on, another clock um, in this more or less allegorical style is this so-called Samson clock. And this is another very similar, most likely from very similar period. It could be 1830s, even as late as 1840s. Uh, but very beautifully done, and on a pedestal, like the Apollo clock. We also have, in this line, a youth on a rowboat. And this is, uh, again, the Ormolu style, which is the hammered gold, which is a, a so-called translation from the French uh, a, a technical style which required the use of mercury in its production and in France was banned by, I believe, 1830 because of the dangerous uh, dimension of this application. Um, but this is a very, very uh, ornate piece and uh, would have been a quality item, uh, an expensive object to uh, acquire. So... But it is uh, very, very beautiful. And he probably ordered the uh, the statue portions of the clock from elsewhere and inserted his own uh, fabrication, uh, the timepiece, in, in within, within the clock itself. Um, it does appear that he was acquiring uh, these statue pieces from a seller in Paris, and he would have had links to Paris because of his work study that he did there between approximately 1820-24-25. Another interesting piece, another pendulum clock, is this really beautiful lion statue clock. And the pendulum is almost as in the, in the form of a sun or a flower or something of this... Uh, but it's interesting in that this has a lot of this black wood around it. It is up on a pedestal like the others, but it's um, surmounted by this um, really beautiful lion on top. So uh, this is another example of his uh, fab fabrication. Uh, the last piece that I would like to discuss is a really beautiful clock in alabaster. And this is really interesting because it's domed by a glass dome. Uh, and this alabaster clock is in a, on a pedestal. But it, once again, it just shows the, the beauty of these pieces at this time. And mm, it must also uh, relate to the, the uh, type of the, the caliber of customers that he was uh, serving. Of course, his watch shop was in central Copenhagen and uh, within a few blocks of the castle. Uh, so this was probably a very prestigious area, a very uh, luxurious uh, or catered to those uh, who had money. It would, would have been a main uh, commercial area in the heart of old Copenhagen. So, uh, but uh, it this just tells very much about uh, the um, clientele that he was reaching and the fact that he was there in business so, for so long too that uh, uh, we're speaking of 30 to 40 years at least his child uh, Francois Louis uh, Francois Louis he did uh, re-immigrate via Switzerland to the United States and uh, settled there with his family and uh, it appears to have done some watchmaking there he was called in genealogical records, Francis Lewis, watchmaker, one intended. So it's really interesting that 
at least one of his children followed in his footsteps. Uh, this this tells a little bit about the uh, seriousness. But of course, he was a master watchmaker. He was. Uh, this is the top notch uh, designation, and there is some reason to believe that he may have had some possible association with the Jurgensens of Denmark. But uh, this has not been absolutely documented. One wonders how he settled on Denmark as a location. But the Blaisleons of, of La Ravine were very well connected, and this always remains a possibility. Uh, so this is just a little documentary about uh, H.L. Montandon, who established himself in Copenhagen. He is the only Montandon watchmaker to have signed his watchmakers Copenhagen. So this is just another note for the record, and I hope you enjoyed it.